Um, so what's, what blew my mind and what fused my brain, and really over the last five, four, three years I've been working here, I've got to say, I think I've just become too critical. Nothing blows my mind anymore. Um, if, I, if I think back to what really blew my mind, it has to be back in undergrad, the first time I picked up knowledge of social imagery, Barnes, um, scientific knowledge of uh, sociological analysis, looking at the Barnes Bloor and Henry book, looking at David Bloor's classic principles of sociology of scientific knowledge and saying, yes, you know, how, how have we been looking at science so unsystematically? Um, how can we not think about the same sort of causes of belief, regardless of whether we believe the beliefs to be true or false? How, you know, how have I not been thinking like that? So that's what blew my mind. And I, I guess if I had thought about it a little bit more, that's what I would have been speaking about today. But actually, that's something that we've all kind of taken on board. So I do want to say, What's come, so, so what I'm going to actually talk about today, I'm not going to talk about those two books, which we've all sort of embedded, we, 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 we know far too well in this, but I'm going to tell you about reading most recently States of Knowledge um, by Sheila Jasanoff and, um, and a tiny little rant on Aramis by Bruno Latour. So pretty much exactly a month ago, I was in your institution, Professor, Professor Scott, um, and um, I was presenting on my early findings of my research looking at the role of social science within um, Defra and Stephen Yearley's walked in again halfway through my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just happened again, it's quite funny. Um, and so there I am, and talking about the role of social science in the Department of, en of Environment, Food and World Affairs, and someone puts their hand up and says at the end, have you read States of Knowledge? And oh, that's the third time someone said that to me in a year. It's about time, right? So I sat down, I, I, went, and I went away, and sure enough, right, this idea of co-production is an immensely powerful idea, a language that we can, I mean, I mean, there's so many things I like about it, right? So, Firstly, Sheila Jasanoff's own chapter, chapter two, presents a really beautiful literature review that cuts right, well, I mean, it, it reconciles the tears that we have in the STIS community, or at least in what was then the STS community. So she bridges across the science studies and the technology studies literature to say that actually we're all doing co-production. This is not about, um, this, this is not about science studies versus technology studies. This is um, about the co-production of socio-technical systems and, well, yeah, socio-technical systems. Or, or just fundamentally, the way we see the world cannot be take, uh, taken apart from the way in which we interact in it. That's, you know, so it cuts right across debates in science studies and technology studies. It cuts across, um, right, bridges over debates between SSK and actor network theory to say that actually we're all co-productionists now. Um, so that's one thing I really love about it. The other thing, um, I, it's, it's probably the most positive article I've ever read by Brian Wynne. Have you, have you read it? He, he actually speaks positively about the, the um, European Energy Agency. I mean, isn't that nice? <laughs> um, and, so how am I for time? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think there's a really powerful message there with co-production, um, whether we're thinking about making institutions, discourses, representations um, or identities. And I've seen it in my own work. So just yesterday, I was doing an interview um, with a policymaker in, in DEC, and he was telling me how um, the idea of um, the behavioral sciences, the rise of the behavioral sciences over the recent years has, um, 
has been accompanied has been accompanied accompanied by the rise in well just a change in conception of what government is about so now so at the time particularly 2007 2008 people were talking about um, you know what is opening up the question what do we do as a government department well actually we are in the business of behavior change and he set it out to me whether it's regulation whether it's fiscal incentives whether it's bringing stakeholders together so why shouldn't we be adopting the behavioral sciences and therefore we have that co-production so fantastic it gives me a paper if there's any other if there's not any other reason for me to love that book um, potentially gives me a paper I mean it's up to you guys <laughs> um, but then, as I said at the beginning, I'm far too critical now, aren't I? So, yeah, it's probably the closest thing I've come to blow my mind. Um, but actually, how different is co-production? How useful is the idea of co-production? So, it's an idea that we can apply to the questions that we've already been asking in STS, I feel. I don't feel like it provides a new method. method. I don't think it's rigid enough to be a framework. I think the, the chapters are so disjointed and, and, I mean, really broad. And in that sense, they, they are potentially a strength, but they're also a weakness in that I don't... It's a nice term, but I don't see what else there is there. But that's my personal reflection on it. Um, so... Well, I think there's something to be said. I do think there's something to be said for trying to build a common language. Um, I know that, you know, if you're trying to bridge divides in science, technology, and innovation studies, I know that Sarah Parry has been thinking about this with science studies and uh, policy studies, and maybe there's a conversation to be had there. Um, and I think, you know, to an extent, we are all co-productionists now. I think it's really easy to see a lot of what we do through that lens, um, though maybe I haven't made a compelling case for that. Um, <laughs> But my, I'm still a little bit, you know, I'm still a little bit wary about, about it. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know. We, we can discuss. <laughs> um, so, so that's what I wanted to say is what blew my mind. Um, and what's, what's fused my brain? Well, I wish I had a copy of Aramis's... Uh, uh, Bruno Latour's Aramis for the Love of Technology, which I couldn't get out of the library to show you guys, but it's a 300-page book. It is as long as states of knowledge. And what, what, I mean, the basic argument is that you cannot will technology into existence. So it's really complicated, and that after this long, arduous process of reading loads of different documents and receiving five different voices, one of which is Aramis himself. Sorry, I should say Aramis is the personal rapid transit system, which um, was a new innovation which didn't really take off in, in France. Um, so after all of that, um, so, so yeah, eventually the network just dissipated and, and it didn't get built. 300 pages. And, and one of them was devoted to Aramis's uh, own voice. The, the train has a voice, and it says, what, was I not enough of a train for you? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I acknowledge the argument, um, in as much as it is one. Um, but it's just a little bit too long, and, and that's what fused my brain about it, to put it delicately. Um, OK, but it'd be really great to hear your own reflections and what your brains what blew your minds as well thank you <laughs>